I'm especially humbled to be part of this uh, really nice lineup of early career scientists. Um, and um, I will talk to you today about some algorithms um, that can relate genomics and morphology. Uh, this is a theme that's very central to uh, the research that's going on in my group. We're very, in particularly, we're very interested in understanding how cells integrate information across various scales. And in order to do this, we build multimodal data analysis methods that integrate uh, information across multiple modalities. And today I'll talk to you a little bit about joint tension and gene expression models, as well as automatic tension inference. I'll touch upon um, on these problems a little bit. Um, so what does multimodality and deep learning have to do uh, with biology? We all know uh, the research landscape has changed dramatically in the past 50 years. Um, only in, um, in biology-related uh, fields, uh, uh, there's been quite a lot of, of course, these numbers are much bigger in uh, general computer science literature and statistics, but uh, deep learning and uh, multimodal data analysis have been very popular. It's going to be very hard to catch up with all this literature if one wants to get started. Um, and this is, has really been encouraged by the fact that we have um, access now as computational biologists to a very rich source of data that's been building upon um, new innovation in microscopy and other imaging techniques. So we have the ability to integrate data from one cells, from few cells, or from aggregates, like it's the case of histology slides all the way on the right. And on the genomic side, um, we have access to unprecedented views from multiple uh, coordinates in the cellular uh, biology. Um, I primarily work with gene expression, chromatin accessibility, and TCR motifs, but I'm also interested in how spatial coordinates and cell-to-cell -cell interactions impact uh, biology at various scales. Um, and one of the important things to keep in mind is that all these modalities come up with different constraints. The data is various, it's different. Um, some data is fixed length, some data is variable length. And uh, depending on what are the statistical assumptions about this data, this will change the algorithms and models that we'll be using. Um, in this talk, I'll focus on morphology and gene expression. Morphology and gene expression comes in multiple flavors, but um, the most two popular uh, version of uh, how to think about this problem algorithmically is if we think about it in terms of paired or unpaired data. So in paired data, we assume that we have a unique correspondence um, that is known to us between two different data modalities, and these data modalities are X and Y. So um, in this case, there is some sort of function that connects them, even though there might be some latent information available to us. While in the unpaired setting, uh, we have access to distributions uh, that are not necessarily in a one-to-one -one correspondence. So in here, like you can see um, photos of various uh, landmarks and why can be famous paintings um, um, of these landmarks, but it's not necessarily that they have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and there's been a lot of work in computer science on this um, on this type of problem. They're both in biology. They're both um, encountered quite often in the unpaired setting. And this is not one um, setting I will be talking up about, but I will refer you to the excellent work of Karen Yang from the Caroline Uller group that uh, has spent quite a bit of time thinking about how to integrate information from multimodal data analysis when you don't have a clear correspondence between uh, images and gene expression or a taxic. Uh, so there's been a lot of work in this space, especially in the case when experimental technology does not allow you to um, query information from one cell or multiple cells at the same time with the genomic information that those cells contain. Um, and this is the very important limitation that's experimental, but there are quite a few technologies that are trying to mediate that. So for example, SeekFish is one of these technologies. Um, in the next few slides, we're going to focus exclusively on paired integration of uh, data, uh, an example of which is the attempt to correlate, correlate um, and connect uh, images coming from histological slides to gene expression. Uh, and this has been, um, work uh, that I've done as a graduate student in Barbara Engelhardt's group. Um, and uh, there's uh, two related uh, but methodologically distinct works that um, if you want to learn more about this, you can, you can read. 
So um, in, in this particular work, one thing to notice is that we had access to histology data from um, tissues uh, of multiple patients uh, involved in the GTEx consortiums. And we had associated gene expression data from the same patients in the same tissues. Um, and what are, what are one of the things that both paired and unpaired multimodal data analysis have in common is, um, is that we would really ideally want to find a way to automate classical bioimage analysis. And here, um, there's a wonderful doodle by my collaborator, um, Virginia Ullman, uh, where the sentiment is uh, depicted appropriately. We would really like to um, use algorithms, machine learning if necessary, to understand how we can quantify variability of cell morphology and cellular organization, or uh, maybe recover modalities when data collection is expensive. So maybe we can use this for experimental design and um, also perform hypothesis testing. So these are the goals that both paired and unpaired data modalities share. And at the crux of a lot of these methods, there are some very, very simple ideas. One of these ideas that kind of uh, stood the test of time is um, uh, from a paper by Hotelling, uh, which is very old, 1936, about the relations between two sets of variables, or more commonly known as canonical correlation analysis. So in canonical correlation analysis, the goal is to start with two different uh, matrices of different dimensions. And the idea is to find projections of these two different matrices into a joint latent space where the correlation is maximized. And this idea is quite powerful and we make use of it when trying to relate images and gene expression. The main, um, the main um, challenge here is that finding, um, in finding the right embeddings and representation of both images and gene expressions carries a lot of uh, uh, challenges. And in this particular case, I'll show you, um, uh, I show you a representation of um, of uh, our algorithm, which involves convolutional neural la layers for embedding the histology slide into a lower dimensional space, and then solving the uh, canonical correlation analysis problem in this lower dimensional space to recover both joint and modality specific um, uh, representations. So here are represented in blue, uh, also allowing for a decoding of the signal. Uh, for those of you that are more interested in uh, probabilistic inference, um, this model is generative. So we can think about the latent embedding as being a Gaussian variable that sampled from uh, a mean zero. And uh, we can think about each of the modalities also having associated latent factors, uh, ZK, that are sampled from, uh, from such a distribution. And we can think about the uh, data uh, xk being a transformation of this through some filter f. And this is a um, um, very classical way of formalizing the problem. It's very similar to factor analysis, hence the, um, the assumption that the latent space is supported into a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian space. Um, when, f, when f is linear, uh, the problem is known as probabilistic canonical correlation analysis. And this is a probabilistic interpretation of the old Hotelling work introduced by Bach and Jordan in 2005. And I should say here, really, if uh, F uh, theta is identity, uh, then you would have um, probabilistic canonical correlation analysis. The advantages of this model with respect to the original Hotelling um, formulation is if you remember the Hotelling formulation, you're really embedding two. Uh, two modalities, not more. Um, and that model is not generative. So um, if you want to generate a corresponding gene expression from an image, you wouldn't be able to do so. Bianca, um, is that is, so is that an analog of probabilistic PCA? And is there, is there an analog of the theorem of Tippick and Bishop that in the, in the Gaussian setting, the maximum likelihood solution really is just the, um, the uh, linear co canonical correlation? I, I, yes, they're very related, but they're, um, they're a little bit different in the sense like, you know, um, I think you can uh, convert one into another. But um, yes, they're very, very related. And we can talk more about this um, offline in the, in the question session. Thank you. Yes, sounds great. Yeah, uh, thanks. But that's a great question. 
Um, and what, what can we really do and learn uh, from these uh, particular models? Well, we can learn the reconstructions and you can see some blurry reconstructions here that of course can be improved with better architecture. Um, on the top, we can see the original one. On the bottom, we can see the reconstruction. In a similar way, we can do reconstruction for the covariance of gene expression. Here, I depicted only a few of the genes that were um, maximally expressed just for ease of visualization. But there are some, you know, there, are, there there's a lot of work to improve this uh, particular setting. But one of the things that we can get is we can reconstruct both gene expression and uh, images. We can also perform hypothesis testing. So if we want to look a little more deeply at what the model is learning, then we can um, estimate the parameters corresponding to the latent components uh, Z and ZK. Um, and um, in, in this particular data set, we had uh, information across many tissues. So we could see if um, particular components were significantly uh, different for particular tissues rather than others. So we could find maybe latent components that were tissue specific and find the corresponding image feature that would generate that component. So this is again, very descriptive. And uh, of course we can put hypothesis testing um, at work to make us make these statements quantifiable. The other thing that one can do is maybe visualize gradient. So here we um, plotted um, uh, the images corresponding to the components that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, and one can then try to hypothesize on whether this uh, structure is real and maybe confer with psychology um, uh, pathologists on whether um, on whether there is some structure that is meaningful or uh, informative for um, for health or uh, various disease um, phenotypes. Um, so these are all things that are really good, um, but. I'm a single cell genomic scientist and I'm one why what I really want to know is like what are the lessons that this particular type of analysis can show me for a single cell uh, data analysis. And one thing to note is that histology and genomic data and pairing them is a very particular problem because if you go back to this you know the cells boundaries in this problem are not visible these are aggregates of tissues um, there's a lot of um, granular structure that maybe it's not immediately available to us. So there's a lot of context about individual cells that's missing. The other thing that's very important to note is that the expression that we have access to is actually gene expression from a bulk, a bulk data. So there's no way of connecting one particular cell in that image um, to one particular gene expression. Uh, profile. So this this can be um, this can be quite problematic if we want to make more precise statements about the biology at work, and at best we can make statements about only very large effect uh, correlations. Um, so one one of the things that I'm actively thinking about is. Uh, can we take any lessons from this analysis um, where the modeling as a Gaussian and a transformation is rather appropriate because there's a lot of averaging involved, but can we take these lessons and would they tell us anything informative in cases where we do actually know more about morphology and cellular um, uh, models. So one system could be, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of interest in microscopy studies like SIGFISH or in the memoir system where you can actually visualize cells and their morphology as well as maybe correlate this with information about the proteins that are expressed um, uh, inside these cells. Um, and I think that going forward, the most important uh, goal for us as a community is to find settings where we actually have a hypothesis of, about what the ground truth would be, to really calibrate whether these models that are really nice and interesting can actually tell us something that's interpretable in terms of a hypothesis uh, generation model. Um, and one of the problems that I'm very interested in uh, is uh, how to correlate um, tension with genomics. Uh, the understanding, this problem is not a new problem, and um, uh, Eric Wieschaus uh, has been doing a lot of work in the context of development and drosophila development in trying to understand how uh, tension shapes tissues and how this tension is uh, affecting gene expression profiles. So uh, the key questions here are whether we can understand how 
tissues are shaped by the mechanical forces and how these mechanical forces are generated. So perhaps tension is a good a uh, study case for looking at this um, um, morphology and genomics methods a little closer. So what we did in my work with uh, my, uh, thank you, with my master's student, uh, Louis de Benoit, we, we tried to create a set of um, toy models and really a zoo of examples where we would have morphology and uh, genomics, but the morphology would actually be indicative of uh, cells. So we um, developed a Python package, uh, which uh, we will make public soon um, for inferring uh, tension, um, and uh, kind of coupling Voronoi diagram generation processes uh, with uh, maps of actual how much tension or pressure a cell feels. So um, in order to make data tabular, we have to kind of reduce the dimensionality of the fact that the cell might have multiple neighbors. So instead we compute a pressure mask instead. Um, each pressure is kind of the stress, the average stress that the cell is feeling from its neighbors. And um, uh, this is um, really, this is built based on uh, segmentation work that's done in the bioimage analysis to extract cell boundaries. And then uh, we use a variational method of stress inference uh, presented in a, in a previous paper for computing what the tension between boundaries are. Again, these are not me real measurements of cell tension, but these are geometric information that us as humans can compute very easily if we look at an image. And our question was, if we are to be provided with this ground truth information, are the algorithms that we have so far enough to recover them? So what we did, uh, we generated a large set of uh, pair tension and gene expression data sets, and we asked if we um, have um, either one or the other, would we be able to automatically label, label uh, an image of cells with its corresponding pressure? Um, we generalized, we provided a generalization for our algorithm by taking into account the fact that possible areas of cells would be correlated spatially. So we added a linear map with a uh, um, Laplacian constraint. We can talk more about this in the conversation. Um, but um, at, the end, um, at the end of the day, the take home is um, these models are actually, so if we don't consider any sort of uh, prior information relating to spatial organization, so this corresponds to gamma equals zero, we actually are not able to recover much information about uh, tension, which would be quite a simple task to do. Um, if we increase the prior information that we get related to the spatial information, uh, then we are able to recover some signal. However, the signal is variable and, um, and there's still a lot of work in this space to make sure that the right architectures are right and whether um, these architectures are actually robust. So they give us information that's actually useful um, rather than, rather than uh, an embedding that uh, can be visualized or clusters. So um, can we learn something more through these algorithms rather than just correlation? Um, the part with some parting, I would like to leave you with some parting thoughts and kind of like, uh, what do we need as a community to um, push this work forward? Well, there's a growing set of models for multi-view data, but it's very necessary for us to have a, an honest conversation about what can this multi-view data analysis methods allow us to uh, query beyond visualization and clustering. As a community, we need a zoo of open source benchmark tasks. I started working on it. So if you're interested, you can email me and we can talk more about it. Um, kind of trying to develop a zoo of failure modes for the existing algorithms in order to understand where innovation is actually necessary. And um, uh, finally, we need to think a bit more deeply about what does interpretability mean for image genomics analysis. Uh, and this is something that um, um, I'm hoping to uh, to update you more on in future future talks. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my um, uh, co-authors on uh, the paper on end-to-end -end probabilistic CCA, uh, as well as my um, master student Louis and my collaborators from uh, from Cambridge University, Feng Zhu Zhong and his graduate student Yishalan. 
Um, and uh, a special thanks to uh, Virginia Ullman, who is uh, the artist of the wonderful doodles you saw, but also a terrific scientist at the EBI. Uh, Hanna Yevik and Adrian Halu, we wrote a recent developmental biology review paper on how to properly use deep learning for bioimage analysis. Um, and uh, some of the ideas that I talked about here are echoed uh, in that review uh, paper, which I invite you to read and uh, send us comments about. Today, I will talk about um, emergence of tissue division of labor through cell interaction and spatial cues. So when we think of single cell gene expression data, we often see that cells form certain patterns in gene expression space, uh, including continuum of uh, expression, even for cells of the same type. Uh, but the origin of such patterns is usually unclear. One theory that uh, addressed this is the Pareto optimality theory. It was developed by the lab of Uri Alon at the Weizmann Institute, uh, where I so did my PhD. Um, and in this theory, we think of the cells as multitaskers that need to perform multiple tasks in the tissue that has a trade-off. This tr trade-off means that if a cell performs one task better, uh, it comes at the expense of, other, of performing other tasks. And then the theory predicts that um, the optimal trade-off would be accomplished when the cells lie in low dimensional polytopes in gene expression space, where the number of vertices correspond to the number of tasks that they trade off. Uh, so for, in the case of three tasks, it would be a uh, triangle, four tasks, a tetrahedron, and so on. And then cells that are near the corners, near the vertices are specialty cells specializing at each task and cells in the middle are generally performing all tasks. And we've shown um, a few years ago that if you consider um, a group of cells and their collective performance, and if there is no external signal in the tissue, then the optimal solution is for cells to either cluster into distinct groups of uh, specialty cells or for all cells to be generalist. So where does the continuum of expression that we often see in real data come from? Uh, so one possible explanation is the presence of an external global gradient in the tissue, like, like oxygen, that affects the performance of the cells in different functions. Uh, in the presence of such gradient, then the theory predicts that uh, the optimal um, uh, task allocation is a continuum of specialization where you have both specialist and generally cells. And in tissue space, the specialist cells will be located in position uh, where the um, conditions are best to perform their functions. We demonstrated this theory for intestinal enterocytes. These are cells that lie along the intestinal villus and are influenced by uh, an oxygen uh, gradient. And indeed, we've shown that uh, individual enterocytes lie along a one-dimensional curve um, and trade off between three different tasks where the specialist enterocyte cells are located in spatial position uh, in the villi where their performance is highest. But we know that not all cell types are influenced by global gradient, and some cells use local cell cell interactions to control their specializations. For example, fibroblasts use growth factors and other signals to control their behavior in the tissue um, and to become more active. Uh, immune cells like macrophages become either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory in response to the cytokines that they sense. And the delta notch pathway uh, is a mechanism that is a content dependent interaction between cells uh, that uh, provides lateral inhibition that cells use to take on different cell fates during development and also in maintaining homeostasis in different tissues, including the colon. And so um, in all of these examples, cells use local information and cell cell interactions and, and are not, not uh, depending on a global gradient in the tissue. So together with my wonderful collaborators, Noah, Moriel, Alex, Cueva, we, we will soon hear from, and Mornit San, we're asking what would be the optimal task allocation for cells that use cell cell interactions to regulate their performance? And how would that be different from having an external gradient in the tissue that affects the performance of the cells? Um, in addition, we wanna ask if we can use this theoretical framework to say something about the mapping between the patterns in gene expression space and the arrangement of cells in the tissue space. So to address these questions, we uh, consider, uh, we model the collective performance of cells uh, where they contribute to several tasks in the tissue. Um, and we assume that the performance of the cells is affected by what it's, the neighbor cells are performing. And so, in the, for example, in the case of lateral inhibition, if the neighbor cells are uh, very good at performing task A, 
This means that the, the, the cell will have a lower uh, score in performing the same task and it will perform other tasks. So the way that we model that, we consider this, the total performance function, uh, which is a function of all the tasks and the contribution in each task is a sum over all the cells. Every cell has a, a self-performance component, which is a function of its gene expression profile. And it is multiplied by the effect of nearby cells, by, by what the nearby cells are performing. And then we uh, look for the gene expression profile of all the cells that would maximize this function. Um, an important parameter that we play with in this model is the neighborhood size, so the number of cells that affect uh, each cell's performance. Um, and so we can uh, consider short-range interaction with only nearest neighbors or longer-range uh, interaction when we average over more cells. So here are our uh, model um, result, simulation results. Uh, when we consider a two-dimensional grid of cells and we consider that they need to perform three tasks that have trade-off, um, and the top row, you can see um, the optimal solution in, in expression space. And in the bottom, you can see uh, the arrangement of cells in tissue space, where we color the cells according to their uh, specializations. And we change the, the, the parameter going from left to right is the range of the interaction. So without any interaction at all, the optimal solution is for all cells to have the same expression profile to be generalized in the middle of the triangle in this case. When we introduce interaction of short range with where every cell is affected by its four nearest neighbors, we get a salt and pepper type of pattern. And in expression space, the cells um, are pushed away to the circumference of the triangle. And as we increase the range of interaction uh, that affects the performance of each cell, uh, we see that more and more cells become generalists until we get a full continuum between specialist and generalist cells. And in tissue space, we see emergence of um, interesting patterns that we often see in real tissues of stripes and islets of these different uh, specialist cells. So looking at these patterns that um, are explained by cell-cell interaction, we see that um, also cell-cell interaction can lead to a continuum of specialization, continuum of expression. And comparing it back to the global gradient case, we see that although in expression space, um, the theory predict uh, a very similar pattern, in tissue space, we see a very clear difference. And the difference is that with global gradient in the tissue, the, the archetypes, the cells that specialize in different tasks would be located in distinct position in the tissue and will be far from each other in tissue space where the conditions to perform their functions are best. But with lateral inhibition, um, uh, in fact, the archetypes can be close to each other. This is where they highly affect each other's performance. And we can quantitatively look at this difference by uh, measuring the pairwise distance, the distance between every pair of cells in expression space versus in physical space, where we see with global gradient that there is a clear correlation, again, indicating that um, cells that are far in expression space will also be far in tissue space. But with cell-cell interactions, uh, there is no correlation, and in fact, archetypes tend to be closer to each other in tissue space. So now we have um, maybe a way when we look at real data to um, say something about the origin of this division of labor, whether it comes from a global gradient or cell cell interactions. So to test our theory, we consider fibroblasts. These are cells that are found in most tissues. Um, they are a classic example of multitasker that need, need to perform multiple important functions for the tissue. Um, they are known to produce many signals, including uh, growth factors, hormones, chemokines that in turn affect their own behavior. One example of that is their transition into myofibroblasts, more active form of the cells where they produce extracellular matrix. These cells also produce the scar when we get um, cuts. Uh, and this is in response to um, uh, growth factors, including TGF beta. So we're uh, analyzing. Uh, spatial transcriptomic data of colon fibroblasts. These, these experiments were led by Inbala Ram Davidi, um, and she was able to map the different cell types in the colon tissue spatially, and we're focusing on the fibroblast population, uh, which here marked in red. So here are the results from the SlideSeq data. Here, every point is an individual fibroblast, and um, they are projected here on the first two principal components. We find that fibroblasts uh, fit in a, a triangle. And in order to infer the three tasks that they specialize in, we're looking at genes that are enriched near each one of the vertices. 
So for example, this collagen gene is highly expressed near this um, uh, vertex, allowing us to infer that uh, fibroblasts here are specializing in ECM production. Um, these fibroblasts are um, myofibroblasts, um, have a myofibroblast phenotype, and we have another archetype of metabolism and regulation of immune response. So since it's lactic data, we also have information about the spatial position of the cells. So here we color the cells uh, in, in spatial position based on their performance um, when they trade off between these three tasks. So we see that the pattern um, is that the different uh, specialty cells are mixed. So they don't have distinct position in the tissue and they tend to be close to each other. And this can also be shown if we um, measure the pairwise distance in expression versus physical space, we see that there is no correlation and the archetypes tend to be close to each other in um, tissue space. So these patterns support the notion that perhaps fibroblasts use cell-cell interactions to um, regulate their division of labor. To further validate that cell-cell interaction play an important role here, we, and the next thing we wanted to do is to map ligand receptor interactions between these different specialist cells within the fibroblast population. So to do that, we're looking for a situation where there is a ligand that is enriched near one archetype and is corresponding receptor enriched near another archetype. In this situation, we would um, then conclude that these archetypes interact with each other. Um, so in order to map ligand receptor interaction, we've analyzed single cell rna seq data of colon fibroblast. Um, here, uh, we find that fibroblast fit in a five verdict simplex, and we were able to infer from looking at the enriched genes, uh, the five complexes of tasks, where two of these uh, tasks, the myofibroblast and ECM production task, um, map are very similar to the two archetypes that we found in the slice data, where they have similar enriched genes um, near their archetypes. So we've um, used this single cell rna seq data to map the ligand receptor interaction between uh, the different archetypes, allowing us to infer this uh, archetype crosstalk network. Here, um, every uh, node in the network is representing an archetype of fibroblast, uh, of fibroblasts, and an edge between two archetypes um, indicates that there is a ligand uh, enriched near one archetype and its receptor enriched near another archetype. And the width of the arrows indicate the number of ligand receptor pairs uh, that are found to be enriched. So first, what you can see is that there is a lot of crosstalk between every pair of archetypes. Um, and interestingly, in one of these interactions, we found that delta notch, um, which is exactly a mechanism for lateral inhibition, is enriched between the two archetypes, the ECM production and myofibroblast archetype, which are the two archetypes going back to the slide data that reside next to each other in tissue space and form this boundary. You can see here when we color the cells based on these two marker genes for these two archetypes, we see indeed that they are very close to each other. And in this data, we see that they are enriched for delta notch um, interaction. So uh, this again uh, supports this hypothesis that fibroblasts use lateral inhibition and other types of interactions to control their um, division of labor. Uh, we can also use our approach um, when, in case that we don't have spatial uh, information about the cells, to demonstrate this, we've analyzed single cell data of lung, fibroblast, and macrophages. Here in the lung, we also find fibroblast to fit in a five uh, vertex simplex, also trade-off trade between uh, five uh, uh, tasks and macrophages lie in a tetrahedron um, and have these four different macrophage tasks. When we infer the archetype crosstalk network for these uh, um, data, we find again that there is a lot of crosstalk between the different archetypes. Um, and when we compare that to the intestine and pterocytes, where as I, saw, as I showed you in the beginning, these cells we know are influenced more by a global oxygen gradient in the tissue. We indeed see that there is less interaction between the archetypes and the interaction is uh, restricted to cells that are close to each other in tissue space. Um, so with that, I wanna summarize. Uh, so I've shown you that uh, combining the Pareto optimality theory with cell cell interactions can help us to disentangle global and local effects on division of labor and tissues, and more generally to understand organization of, of cells in the tissue. Um, it will be interesting in the future to further explore these modes of communication where cells 
uh, communicate to each other their performance and affect each other's performance, and to study these new aspects of fibroblast biology that came up in this project, uh, especially in disease states uh, like fibrosis and cancer, that fibroblasts uh, are important in regulating these pathologies. Um, and with that, I want to uh, thank again my wonderful collaborators. I want to thank my mentor, Ruslan Mejitov, my previous mentors, Avi Regev, Urialon, and my funding. And thank you again for this opportunity. It's such a pleasure to be following two great scientists. Um, today, we'll talk about using single cell data to identify disease relevant populations of cells. So, just as a, a brief overview, in the last decade, single cell RNA seq has allowed us to better understand the heterogeneity of cellular types and states in tissues. And researchers are generating atlases of healthy tissues and are continually finding novel. Uh, cell types. For example, in this study from a couple of years ago, um, this was a single cell atlas of the mouse airway. Um, researchers revealed the novel cell type right here, the pulmonary ionocytes. And then it turned out that a marker for this rare population is the gene CFTR, which when mutated causes cystic fibrosis. So this is one path to finding disease associated cell types from single cell studies. However, when it is possible to collect data from both healthy and disease samples, one can more directly try to find disease relevant populations by designing a case control study. And here is an example of a recent study that looked at single cell RNA-seq human data from both healthy individuals and individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And in this study, the researchers identified an astrocytes population, uh, reactive astrocytes, which are enriched in the Alzheimer's samples. And so the typical single cell case control workflow is the following. Um, we have uh, a bunch of animals that are controls and a bunch of animals that are cases. We collect single cell RNA-seq data from these animals. And then we annotate all of the cells uh, that came from the control samples as, for example, label zero. We uh, annotate them as unaffected healthy control cells, as we should. And then on the other hand, we annotate all of the cells that came from the key samples as label one. They're affected by the condition. We assume they're all affected by the disease. So current analysis approaches typically map cells to cell type clusters, and then they examine the case control differences through that lens. So sometimes uh, there might be cell type uh, clusters that are case specific, and they could correspond to disease specific population of cells. And then we can go on and find markers for them and examine their biological function and their role in the disease mechanism. But while some of the cell populations are easy to separate, we might need some more advanced tools to extract the true disease relevant signal in the other cases. And for uh, the remaining clusters that we believe are still legitimate cell type clusters, where uh, we see a mixture um, of uh, case and control labels, what we could do is we could run differential expression using these sample level uh, labels and see what we can find. However, for the differential expression to work, the case control labels have to be accurate. And as we alluded earlier, uh, while all of the cells in the control samples are by definition healthy, um, not all of the cells from the case samples are necessarily affected by the disease or, or, or the condition. Um, and so, Therefore, uh, when we're in this situation, differential expression might fail to detect the disease um, signature because the signal is diluted. As you can see in the bottom, using the sample level labels, uh, we're um, adding a whole lot of um, normal cells potentially uh, labeled as K cells, diluting the signal. Well, so um, next we wanted to have some ground truth way of exploring this phenomenon. And since when we collect uh, cells from healthy and diseased animals, it's generally not possible to have ground truth knowledge of exactly which cells are healthy in the diseased animals and exactly which ones are affected, what we resort to is a semi-simulated approach. 
Um, we took single cell RNA seq data from about 30,000 human bone marrow cells, and uh, we decided to focus on two related cell types. Here in the bottom, you see the memory B and the naive B cells. A memory B cell, uh, sorry, a, a, a naive B cell is a B cell that hasn't been exposed to antigens. And a memory B cell is a naive B cell that has been exposed to antigens in the past, and it is dormantly circulating and it's poised to quickly respond to antigens upon recall. So we know that these are two different cell types and we are able uh, generally to uh, separate them based on their gene expression in, in this context. What we do next is uh, we, um, in this uh, semi-simulated uh, setting, we generate a control set and a case set. And we do it in the way that the control cells are all from one cell type. Here, I've chosen the naive B cells. And the cases are a mixture of naive B and memory B cells. So um, we do this uh, with varying mixtures from 5% of memory B cells in the cases to 90% memory B cells in the cases. Uh, we'll first focus in the next few slides on one data set where we have 10% memory B cells and 90% naive B cells in the cases. But um, just a heads up, the results uh, for the other data sets are consistent with the mixture percentage. And what we want to know first uh, is if the memory B cells would cluster out. Right, so we do the standard analysis pipeline with the idea that the clusters would match the biology, um, the biologically meaningful cell types. And in this case, since we made the data, we know there are only two cell types here. Uh, however, using the default parameters, um, we, we have a surprising number of clusters, surprisingly high. And uh, furthermore, uh, we can see the distribution of case control labels across these clusters. We see that they're all fairly mixed. We see that there is, um, trying to get my, my mouse to point something. Oh, maybe, sorry, I'm not gonna be able to show you um, uh, at the moment, but uh, you can see cluster number five uh, is the cluster that, that is the most unbalanced or the one that appears most enriched in K cells. However, when I review on the right-hand side uh, the, the true labels of the cells, you see that even in that cluster, uh, we fail to separate out the memory B cells. Okay, so what, what we do then is we run differential expression with the labels we have. Those are the global sample level labels. Since we generated this data, we have the ground truth differentially expressed genes. We compute them by running differential expression using the correct labels of naive B and memory B cells for each data set. Here, the x-axis is annotated by these varying mixture percentages of memory B cells in, in our synthetically generated cases. And um, we evaluate our ability to recall these ground truth differentially expressed genes when we use instead the labels we have, the sample level labels. We see that this is a very challenging task. It's even impossible task when the fraction of memory B cells is low. In other words, when we have a large percent of incorrect labels uh, on the case side. So therefore we developed a method um, and our method improves our ability to detect the ground truth genes. Um, and it does that by refining the labels. And now I walk you through how uh, the method works. So, so far we saw that um, in some situations, just using the gene expression profiles alone, we fail to separate out the affected cells. And we also saw that using the sample labels alone, it doesn't work well for the differential expression. However, we can combine these two together, uh, taking advantage that at least some of the labels are correct, and that allows us to refine the labels. And what we do first, is we reduce the dimensionality of the input data, for example, using principal components analysis. And then we train a classifier uh, on the sample level labels. For example, logistic regression, using the reduced features as explanatory variables. The classifier outputs the probability of label one given the reduced features. In other words, in other words, the logistic regression, um, it, it outputs the probability that the cells, that the cell is truly affected given a summary of its expression. 
So we'll affectionately call that output p hat. Um, so here uh, is a demonstration of the data set that I was uh, talking about before. Um, in this split violin plot on the left-hand side, in blue, we see the predictions for the zero class. Um, those are the controls. And on the right-hand side, we see the predictions for the cases. And now, um, to make this even more information rich, because we have the, the true labels, we see uh, in the bottom in gray, the predictions for all of the naive B cells and in red, the predictions for all the memory B cells. And what we see is that the predictions for the memory B cells are close to one. Um, and as a result, uh, when we go and look back up at the blue and orange diagram on top, we see this uh, two component mixture in the predictions for the case label. And we see that because we have designed the case label to be a mixture of these uh, two cell types. All right, so therefore our next step is to cluster the case cells uh, and we can do that. Turns out since this is a one dimensional clustering task, uh, whether you do it with the Gaussian mixture model or with k-means, uh, it works uh, almost identically. Um, and so uh, that is our way to refine the labels. And with these refined labels, we can take them to any downstream task, for example, the differential expression. And this is how we achieve the uh, dramatically improved performance that I demonstrated a couple of slides back. All right, so in the remaining few minutes, uh, I'll just briefly take you through one application um, of this method to real data. So uh, this uh, is data from an experiment that's looking at the process of demyelination and subsequent repair of myelin. Um, there are two conditions. Um, the, the two conditions are called LPC and PBS. Um, the uh, LPC is the case, um, and that is the condition in which the corpus callosum of mice is injected uh, with a compound that is toxic to oligodendrocytes. And oligodendrocytes are, are the, the key cells maintaining myelin um, uh, around the neuronal processes. The PBS or the control uh, is an injection of, of saline. Um, so uh, what is done here is that the, uh, the, the mice are injected, the cells, uh, the, the region that is relevant is dissected, dissociated and sequenced. And this is done across four time points uh, across the trajectory of demyelination and repair. And uh, what we are visualizing here is just the microglial cells. So these are immune cells resident to, to the brain, um, uh, potentially quite relevant uh, to, to uh, all kinds of neurodegenerative processes. We see that there is a plethora of case specific clusters. Uh, so uh, all of these clusters up top, they're, they're uh, specific to the uh, demyelination injection. However, looking at cluster one, this is um, identified by its markers as the homeostatic microglia. We see a mixture of cases and controls. And um, looking at the predictions of our method um, to the homeostatic microglia, so the microglia from this mixed cluster, from one of the data points, uh, we see this um, uh, familiar mixture in the predictions for the cases, this two component mixture, which we could split um, and say that the cells below the threshold are closer to unaffected cells or, or cells from the saline, the control condition. And the cells above the threshold are perhaps different. Um, in the bottom, I'm uh, showing this split by replicate, so split across the three animal replicates of the two conditions, to show that uh, this phenomenon is consistent across the replicates. Uh, and I um, what, what we do after we split is we find uh, markers using differential expression of the um, kind of different cells, um, and um, key markers for this population are consistent with microglial activation, um, found in, in uh, related studies. When we zoom out to look at the predictions across all four time points, our method allows us to uh, notice a shifting proportion of activated to unactivated homeostatic microglia over the course of demyelination. So at first, uh, there is some level, well, at first it's three days post-injection, there is some level of activation uh, over the next few days. Um, that proportion increases. 
And as we get closer to the final time point of repair, we see that uh, the, the balance changes again, uh, favoring more um, the unactivated cells. To summarize, uh, I've very briefly this morning told you a tale of two mice, um, well, more than two, but mice from two conditions. And here are some summary and remarks. Uh, we have developed a method that generates hypotheses about which are the truly affected cells in a case control experiment. And the uh, refined labels that the method outputs uh, improve downstream tasks, such as differential expression. It is um, um, important to note, though, that uh, this has uh, applications beyond the health disease context alone. For example, we could compare um, sex uh, differences uh, by saying maybe not all of the cells, let's say, uh, from a male um, sample are, are entirely different from cells in the female sample. Uh, or uh, we could apply it in the perturbation context, where maybe not all of the cells exposed to a perturbation are actually affected by it. Um, and uh, perhaps most excitingly, and uh, left for future questions, and when you read the paper when it comes out, um, is this remark that uh, we are doing this clustering of the predictions from our classifier to refine the labels, but we can do more. The model is outputting soft labels, our p hats, these probabilities, they're, they're uh, a continuous value between zero and one. And uh, our model has the potential to capture gradient of effect of the condition. So if, it, if we want to ask a question above just which cells are closer to healthy or not, if we want to say maybe they're not all affected equally, maybe, maybe the effect is on a gradient, our method allows us to do so. And with that, uh, I want to mention the other key players in this work, uh, my advisor, Evan Makosko, and the fantastic postdoc in Evan and Beth Stevens's lab, Mike Dolan, who is behind the demyelination experiment. And thank you. I look forward to your questions in the breakout room.